Hello and welcome to our webinar series, Stories from the Archives. Every few months we will explore the stories behind the treasures and unique family history artifacts found in the R. Stanton Avery Special Collections and the archives at the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center at American Ancestors. My name is Ginevra Morse, Vice President of Education and Programming. I will be your moderator for today's program. American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Now, I do want to note that we are broadcasting from our homes to your home with various limitations and distractions. We do apologize in advance if there are any interruptions from our end and we thank you for your patience. If we were to lose connection on our end for any reason, uh, you will still have access to a full recording on our website as well as our YouTube channel. Now the two experts that you'll be hearing from today are Judy Lucy, Senior Archivist, and Todd Pattison, Conservator, here at American Ancestors. Judy joined the staff in 2003 and works to collect, catalog, and care for the millions of individual items in the R. Stanton Avery Special Collections. She received a BS in Education from Northeastern University and an MS in Library and Information Science from Simmons College. Todd works to preserve and care for the Society's collection of books, manuscripts, and fine art. He comes to NEHGS with more than 25 years of experience from the Northeast Document Con Conservation Center and has also worked as collections conservator at the Harvard College Library. Today we'll look at several samplers from our collections. We'll see uh, or hear the stories behind these items uh, and the families who donated them. And we'll also hear some tips on caring for perhaps similar items in your own family collections. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question into the panel to the right of your screen. We'll address those at the end. Uh, there is no handout for this session, but you will be able to watch a recording of this event starting tomorrow again on our website, uh, in our video library, as well as on our YouTube channel. Um, we also have uh, put together a few links and uh, other resources that I will be including in my follow-up email, um, so certainly look for that. But just know if you miss something on today's first listen, uh, don't worry, you can always go back and review the presentation later. All right, so without further ado, I will turn things over to Judy. Thank you, Ginevra, and welcome again, everyone. I'm delighted to be with you today as we again share stories from our archives as we take a closer look at some of the samplers in our collection and the young women who created them. We'll focus today on how we can gain valuable clues from studying the pieces themselves, as well as using samples, samplers as a source for genealogical research and combining them with other records to learn more about the lives of the young women, their families and the communities they lived in. Learning simple or plain needlework was an essential part of a girl's education. It was an important skill for a young girl to know, along with knowing how to cook and managing a household, in order to prepare her to have her own home and family one day. It's been said that until 1840, every girl who had the slightest education had made a sampler. While many were taught by their mothers or other female members of the household, by the late 18th and early 19th century, schools and academy for girls were being, were being established. In this more formal setting, not only was basic needlework taught, but more ornamental embroidery with intricate patterns was being taught as well. Now, these schools were not free. Only families with some means sent their daughters to these schools. Learning plain needlework was part of the basic education cost, but it would cost more to learn more advanced needlework. As this 1827 Concord, New Hampshire newspaper advertisement tells us, it was $3 per quarter to learn plain needlework, but $4 per quarter to learn more ornamental work. Samplers and embroideries therefore were tools of instruction for young girls 
learning not only the elements, the el basic elements to stitching, but it was where they learned their alphabet, practiced their numbers, learned to spell their name, learned something about geography, and religious instruction as well. Here at NEHGS, we have original samplers, but we have also collected the family record data from samplers in handwritten or transcribed format. Why? Well, because our primary focus, or one of our main focuses in our collection policy, is to collect family record data, the births, marriages, and deaths. As you can see by this TypeScript transcription of an original sampler, this has the birth dates for the Oliver and Abigail Arnold family of Paxton, Massachusetts, and can be found online in our digital archive. Now we also have some samplers online. Several years ago, we partnered with the National Society of Colonial Dames of America to digitize and make available some of our samplers online on their website as part of their sampler survey project. The goal of their project is to make information on needlework found in their database as accessible as possible, while at the same time supporting their reputation as a source of knowledge for the history of women's education through needlework. Now, some of you may not be aware that we also have a family tree sampler database on AmericanAncestors.org. The samplers are from the private collection belonging to Dan and Marty Campanelli. Their collection contains over 400 samplers. The database on our website contains just a small sample of about 31 images of family register style samplers. Now, if you're interested in exploring the database further, I'd suggest using the browse feature to locate the database. You can page through the images where it says browse this database, just to the right of the search box. And here's a lovely example from the Campanelli collection, the William and Mary Goodrich family sampler of Wethersfield, Connecticut. Now, we believe this family register style sampler was sewn by Mrs. Goodrich, Mary Stoddard Goodrich. And I just think the imagery is beautiful. If you look at the bottom, you'll see the house and there's a church in the background. And then you have the family record sewn in the middle. Now, as any genealogist would point out, the added bonus is Mary sewed her maiden name Stoddard into the piece. Although we've been collecting materials documenting the lives of American families for 175 years, all of the samplers in our collection were acquired in the 20th century. All represent New England families and sewn on linen, which was the popular fabric of the day, with silk thread all have some sort of family information on them, whether it's just a name, date, place, and then some include family records. So our first example is one that's been in our collection since 1980 and has the very popular verse used by many young women, the stating of their name. Athusa proudly proclaims her name and where she lives in the verse in this sampler. And the, the verse begins, A Thusa Brigham is my name, New England is my station. And she has a little bit of trouble with the third line when she tries to sew the town of Westboro. I think she had a little trouble with her Ws. And she states that Westboro is my dwelling place and Christ is my salvation. In addition to the verse, her sample uses simple cross stitch pattern. It has the three alphabets, some numbers, and there's a decorative motif at the bottom. Athusa stands for Arethusa Brigham, born 1792 in Westboro, Mass. She is the daughter, she was the daughter of David Brigham and Lucy Harrington, and her birth was recorded in the town vital records. She'd also marry in Westboro in 1821 to John Milton Putnam, a congregational minister, and eventually they moved to Dunbarton, New Hampshire, where he became pastor of the congregational church. Now, all the information we know of Arethusa's life comes from Massachusetts town vital records and secondary sources, such as published family genealogies. If we want to research Arethusa's life further, we must turn to the men in her life, in this case, her father and husband, 
as we would need to do for many women of the time period. On the right, you'll see a page with the genealogical sketch of Arethusa's father in the Brigham genealogy. And you see that Arethusa is documented with notes of her marriage and a list of her children. Her father, David, is a direct descendant of Thomas Brigham, the immigrant who settled in Cambridge, Mass. in 1635. Now, her husband was well known for his preaching, and many of his sermons were published. Using his published sermons, one can trace the family's movements by where he was stationed as a clergyman. So Arethusa's sampler takes on greater importance as it is perhaps the only surviving, the only real tangible item created by her. It proves her existence and she's more than just a name on the page and we hear her own voice in this sampler. This next example was originally deposited in our collection in, 18, in 1949, and upon the donor's death, it became the property of NEHGS. Now, the sampler was done by Jeanette Catlin Boardman. She was the daughter of Ebenezer and Mary Holtum Catlin, and she was born on the 26th of August, 1765. Now, you can see the partial date is sewn at the top right of the piece. Jeanette married William Boardman on the 27th of March, 1785, and the family lived in Hartford, Connecticut, and she was a well-known midwife in the area. Now, frequently, these items come with very little information on the family, so in order for us to catalog and describe the item to make it accessible, the archival staff undertakes genealogical research on the family. And we noticed in the recording of the births of her children in the middle of the sampler, the last child's birth to be recorded was Mary Ann Boardman, born in 1798. But she had one more child, and, but her daughter Jane, born in 1801, is not on, recorded on the sampler. So this helped us to date the piece. We think it was created sometime between 1799 and 1800. Jeanette's midwife records survive in readable condition in the manuscript archive of the Connecticut Historical Society. Now, by her count, she delivered over a thousand children between 1815 and 1849. She began when she was eight, age 50, and her last child delivered was in the year of her death at age 84 in 1849. She recorded her entries using a quill pen. She only recorded the father's name, the sex of the child, the date of delivery, and the location of the home. Now, she often recorded the ethnicity or race of the family, so sometimes you'll see things like Irish or colored recorded at the end of the entry, and whether the child lived or died. And she noted any follow-up visits made to the family home. In this example, we have the Sarah Chandler sampler. We know little of Sarah except for what's sewn on the sampler, her name, the year it was done, 1808, and the name of her school. Given to us in 1951 by a descendant, it's the only sampler in our collection where we know the school she attended. You can see that it's a more decorative piece with more intricate embroidery. It has a floral border on all four sides. The verse dedicated to her parents has a bouquet of flowers on each side. And most likely, the verse was assigned by Mrs. Dobles to her students. And below the verse is a two-story house on a green lawn with a fence and trees, birds, and small plants. Now, once these girls mastered the basic skills, a more intricate embroidery was undertaken to show what they've learned, sort of like a final exam. This would be taken home, framed, and displayed in the family home demonstrating the skills the young woman learned. Now, because this piece is associated with the school, it's been loaned out for several exhibits over the years, including it was on display at the Museum of Fine Arts here in Boston. This family register style sampler with, bordered with white flowers and leaves belongs to the Asa Clemens family of Charlton, Massachusetts, with births, marriages, and deaths. Now, we don't know who in the Clemens family did this, 
but if you look at the arrow on the lower right, you will notice the stitching is different in the marriage and death columns. Presumably this was stitched by two different family members. What I personally love about this piece is the information at the top. The arrow at the top points to Ace's three wives. No maiden names were given, but these can be found in marriage records in the town vitals. And the birth and death dates for two out of the three wives are also recorded. Now, the women are listed in order of marriage to Asa. So Mary, Warren, her, his first wife, he married in 1789. She had nine children with Asa and she died in 1810. In the same year, he married his second wife, Ruhama, and she died in 1817 after giving birth to their third child. His third and final wife was Zervaya Gleason of Charlton, Mass, and she was the widow of Reuben Gleason. And only the date of their marriage intention is recorded in the town vitals, that of December 1817. Now, Asa predeceased Zervaya, but in doing additional research, I came across Asa's will. And in the opening paragraph of his will, he mentions that he made an agreement with his wife, Zervaya Gleason, on the day of their marriage. Think of it as sort of probably some sort of prenuptial. And he records the date of the marriage, the 7th of January, 1818. Now with this information, you could update your family history with an actual marriage date. Our next piece is the Cram family, sam family record sampler. Now, unlike other samplers in our collection, this was purchased. Um, this is the fa family record sampler of the Green and Abigail Cram family of Standish, Maine. And we purchased this for $315 on eBay in 2011. And again, it's because we actively collect family records. Now, genealogy, or family register style samplers such as the Cram family and the Asa Clemens family gained in popularity in the early 19th century. As Ethel Stanwood Bolton wrote in her famous work, American Samplers, which was published in 1921, these family register or genealogy samplers serve a double purpose of decorative needlework and a record of the family's births, marriages, and deaths. Like family Bible records, they can also be considered a more accurate source of information than, say, a secondary source. These are frequently done by a member of the family, making the information more reliable, and sometimes events, these things are recorded closer to the event. Now, if you take the family information from a genealogy sampler, sampler like the Cram family record, you can then build on this. It sort of serves as a spring, springboard for further research. If you were to do it in the context of using American ancestors, whether you visit us or researching remotely, you have the ability to research our vast holdings in our research center. So if you were interested in learning more about the Green Cram family or your Cram family ancestors, I'd recommend using the Elmer Cram papers in our special collections. Surname collections such as the Cram Papers trace ancestors beyond the direct line. So Elmer traced all Crams as they moved out of New England and they moved west. The Green Cram fam family folder that you see here on the left contains notes and, tra and it traces Green and Abigail's children and their descendants. Now, in 1989, we published an index to this, these papers, and this is now digitized, and it can be accessed through a link from the book's library catalog record. Our next examples that you see here, they come from the largest collection of family material we own. The Atkinson and Lancaster family collection was bequeathed to NEHGS in 1934, and it contains documents, photographs, artwork, and much, much more. It relates to five generations of the Atkinson family of Newburyport, Massachusetts, and Calcutta, India, the allied Lancaster family of Newburyport, and the Cook family of Salem, Massachusetts. Now, along with those items are three samplers representing three generations of women. 
for today, I'm only showing two of the three. Here on the left is a sampler by Elizabeth Ann Lancaster. She was born in 1828 in Newburyport, Massachusetts, the daughter of Daniel Moody Lancaster and Lydia Gray Cook. And on the right is the sampler created by her maternal grandmother, Hannah Gray. The third sampler, which I'm not showing today, was done by Elizabeth's mother, Lydia Cook Lancaster. Now Elizabeth's sampler was created when she was 11 in 1839. And it, as you can see here, it's the traditional pattern of the time. But its significance is the spelling of the surname. Notice that she spells the Lancaster with a K and an E, and not the more common spelling of C-A. Now the family strictly used this spelling until the mid to late 19th century. Her maternal grandmother, Hannah Gray, was born in 1774 in Salem, and she died in 1859. Now Hannah married into a family of sea captains. Both her husband, Caleb, and son by the same name went to sea. Now, Hannah only recorded her name in this sampler, not the date, but we do have a clue in the verse that she sewed to help us narrow the time period. Notice where I have the arrow pointing. It's pointing to the letter S in progress. And note that she uses the old style S, the long S that looks like an F. This style was very popular up until about the early 1820s when it fell out of use. So although we don't have a date, we can guess it was done sometime between the late 18th century and before the early 1820s. In 2010, we were contacted by a gentleman who lived on the West Coast, and he was wondering if we would be interested in a sampler created by an ancestor that had been in the family for many years. He wanted to find a home in New England where it originated, and he was concerned as to what would happen to the piece. After some discussion and an email of the image of the sampler, we accepted it, and the Harriet Shaw sampler arrived from California. Now, Harriet was born in Danvers in 1820, the daughter of William Shaw and Mary Nurse, and you'll see that she prominently features her hometown in her sampler in the very first line, and she also records the years that she created it at the very bottom. She married Allison or Ellison Galusha on the 21st of January, 1841 in Danvers. Now, little did we know at the time of the donation that this sampler would have direct family ties with another collection in our archives. In 2007, we received 14 cartons of genealogical research from the estate of Janet Galusha Helgemo. Janet did extensive research on the Galusha families of Salem and Danvers, including Harriet's husband, Ellison, and his family line. Now, much of the research went into her 1968 publication on the Galusha family, which we have in our library. But Janet continued researching this family until her death in 2007. Therefore, this manuscript collection contains much more research than the book. Now, in researching this family to learn more about Harriet Shaw, we consulted Janet's book. And I've highlighted here in the sketch their third child, Abby. Now, she married John Keith in 1870, and the donor's surname is Keith. So we concluded that Abby must have inherited her mother's sampler, and it remained in the family for several generations, brought with the family when they moved west until her descendant donated it to us in 2010. Our next sampler is the Asa Ware family sampler, and it was created by Emily Fisher Ware of Rentham, Massachusetts. And she created this at the age of 10 in 1832 and donated it to us, and it was donated in 1947. So she's the daughter of Asa and his second wife, Ursula Turner, whom he married in 1815. Now the family register, you'll notice the family register, she stitched a little border around that, but there's no main border in this sampler. Now, Emily includes more family information. She includes her father, Ace's first wife, Rena Richardson. She includes her birth and death date, and she also includes the birth and death date of her half-sister, Clarissa. 
Emily married James Holbrookshaw on the 5th of September, 1847, and she lived most of her adult life in Franklin, Massachusetts. After her husband's death in 1899, Emily lived with her unmarried daughter, Clara, until her death in 1905. Similar in design to our other samplers, we have Lucy Taylor Wheeler sampler, which features the three alphabets, numbers, and a religious verse. Now, most of what we know of Lucy comes from the genealogical sketches found in the history of New Ipswich, New Hampshire. Here we learn of who her parents are. She was the daughter of Richard Wheeler and Rebecca Wilson. And we also learn her her marriage to Isaac Crosbury Stearns. He was also a native of New Ipswich. She marries Isaac in 1845, bears him two children, and dies at the age of 34 in 1859. But no birth record can be found for Lucy. So therefore her sampler takes on greater genealogical importance as she provides age at the time it was completed in 1834. She was nine years old. So we can conclude that she was probably born around 1825. Our final piece was made by Caroline Jackson. Caroline was born and raised in the city of Boston, the daughter of Ward and Lucy Nash Jackson on August 15, 1800. She married Samuel Thaxter in 1822 and they had two daughters. She died of cancer in 1846. Caroline created this embroidery piece at the age of nine. Now, we refer to it here as the Caroline Jackson Sampler, but it's really more, it's really, I guess you could think of it more as an embroidery piece. Now, the donor of these family objects, Thaxter Park Spencer, whom I had the pleasure of meeting on several occasions, was a meticulous caretaker of the family treasures. He highly valued the, the information and the materials that his ancestors had passed down to him and he was entrusted with. But he was really concerned about the long-term preservation of these treasures. So he donated his collection to us in 2006 and again in 2007. Now the story behind this piece today is not the family story, but it's what happened to it after its arrival at NEHGS. To tell you more about the preservation of samplers, and the story behind Caroline's needlework, I will turn it over to my colleague, Todd Pattison. Thank you, Judy, and good afternoon, everyone. First, uh, I wanna make sure that we are on the same page when discussing the topic of preservation. So the goal of preservation is to minimize change. The more items change, the more they come into our own time period, and the less they can tell us about the people and the time period in which they were produced. Preservation refers to all the activities that you do to care for and protect your objects now and into the future. Now, often confused with conservation, um, preservation is the overall umbrella of all these activities where conservation is just a small part of preservation. Conservation is the physical intervention to objects to stabilize them um, or improve some type of functionality or aesthetics. The number one issue that I find in samplers is light damage. The William Boardman family object is a great example of what light can do to a sampler. The most obvious sign of damage is the color fading of some of the threads used. Black and other darker colored threads tend to be more light fast, while lighter colors, especially reds and yellows, tend to be the quickest to fade. The discoloration that you see in the support textile can also be partly attributed to light damage, as light can speed up some of the chemical reactions that would cause the sampler to deteriorate. This also leads to damage to the threads on a microscopic level, causing tiny breaks in the fibers, which eventually lead to weakened or broken fibers, and finally holes or losses. Fading and other visible damage, 
which can be seen in the area of loss below the P in progress in the Hannah Gray sampler, is an indication that special handling is required when working with the sampler. Now you should always have clean hands when you're uh, dealing with textiles and avoid using lotions or perfumes as they can cause staining to the pieces. Try not to wear jewelry or bulky clothing, which can catch on textiles and cause damage. And always use two hands to keep items from shifting or distorting when you're handling them. Now for damaged items like this, they would also benefit from a support of acid-free mat board or cardboard so that you are lifting or touching the board and not the textile itself. This will prevent tearing of fibers or further damage to weakened areas. Now this is especially important for very large items which may need additional support. And always remember to stop any actions if they seem to cause stress or damage to the piece. Particularly damaged samplers can be attached to a textile support using thread. This is the back of the William Boardman family sampler showing the unbleached cotton thread that is used to secure this piece to the support. Thread is used so that the treatment is easily reversible. The threads can be cut and the object removed from the support at any time. An adhesive attachment may cause more damage than it prevents and is often quite difficult to remove or undo. An unbleached, uncolored support and thread should be used as dyes or colors can contain chemicals which will cause damage over a period of time and bleached products may have residue bleach which can interact with the fibers in the sampler. Many samplers were framed either originally or at some later point in time. Framing can lead to many preservation issues besides the most obvious one of light damage. Even though the Asa Clemens family sampler is no longer framed, there are areas of damage that are consistent with being framed for many years. Most samplers were attached to a stretcher to hold them taut in the frame, creating a flat surface. Samplers were usually attached to the stretcher with metal fasteners often nails or tacks, creating holes in the sampler, which can be seen here along the right-hand edge. There's also staining that is consistent with prolonged contact with wood. Most woods are highly acidic, especially pine, which is a common wood used for stretchers in America in the 19th century. The acid in the wood ends up burning the textile, causing the dark staining at the edges. NEHGS, like many institutions, store most of our samplers flat in acid-free Bristol or cardstock folders, which are then put in acid-free boxes. This method of storing has many advantages over framing. It takes less storage space in our special collections department. It protects the samplers from light and dust and supports the entire textile as opposed to frame samplers where the threads at the top of the object end up providing most of the support to the rest of the piece. This is also a more convenient way to provide access to these objects to both our researchers and staff. In addition, it offers greater access as the reverse side of samplers are not typically visible in a frame and the glazing of the frame can make it more difficult to distinguish details or see the edges of the object. Flat storage also does not prevent us from exhibiting samplers and frames, as we can save contemporary or important frames and reunite the two when necessary for exhibit. When archivists and museum professionals talk about archival paper, folders, and boxes, what we mean is storage materials made out of acid-free, lignin-free, and buffered or unbuffered paper. Just because something is labeled as archival is not a guarantee of quality. 
It's more of a catch-all term that has no standards or specifications that a manufacturer has to follow. Almost any material can be called archival. You want to concentrate on other terminology that does have specific requirements. Acid-free means that the material has to have a pH of at least seven because anything below seven would be acidic. Lignin is an organic polymer that adds rigidity to plants. It's the material that allows trees to grow so tall, but it contains carbo carboxylic acid, which deteriorates cellulose, which is found in textiles made from cotton or linen. Lignin also darkens when exposed to light, which is why old newspapers tend to be so brown. Now, placing samplers in folders and then in the storage box can help you label and organize them and allows for safer transportation. Be sure to place only one sampler in a folder, which then makes it easier to access the back of the sampler. By simply closing the folder, turning it over, and then opening it again, you can view the opposite side without ever touching the object. Since samplers are very visual, many private owners prefer to have them framed so they can be viewed in their homes. If you have or will frame samplers, there are a few things to focus on with frames to better protect the objects that they contain. If a mat is included as part of the framing package, it should be acid free, as the mat is frequently in direct contact with the sampler. An off-white or uncolored mat is usually the best choice because then you don't need to worry about the pigments that are used in a colored mat. Since light exposure is probably the single most important thing to consider with most samplers, you wanna be sure to use a UV filtering glazing, either glass or plexiglass. It is important to note that your sampler should never be in direct contact with the frame glazing as this can lead to problems, including condensation on the glazing, which will then introduce moisture into the sampler. In this instance, an arrow points to the spacer included in this frame between the glazing and where the object will sit. Spacers are very discreet as they can be made out of an inert clear or black plastic and are usually smaller than the rabbit or the overlap of the frame so that they are not visible from the front. Now, many frames are constructed of wood, which should, be not, which should not be in direct contact with the sampler because of the highly acidic nature of wood. There are several materials that can be used to line the inside of a wood frame to isolate it from the framing package. You also need to be concerned with what is behind your sampler when it is framed, even though this material will not be visible from the front of the frame. Most cardboard, like wood, is also very acidic. So you would want to have an acid-free board behind your sampler. Some frames include other elements that are historic or informational, and that you may wanna keep when reframing or framing a sampler. In this example, there's a contemporary wood backing which has ownership signatures. In order to keep this wood and still protect the sampler, an acid-free mat board or an inert barrier like polyester film or mylar can be placed between the wood or other poor quality materials and the sampler. Now I wanna take you quickly through the conservation treatment of the Carolyn Jackson piece that Judy showed earlier. It's important to mention that conservation professionals specialize in the treatment of objects by material and construction. For instance, I am a book and paper conservator and can perform conservation treatments on paper-based items. Since the Carolyn Jackson object is textile-based, we contracted with an outside vendor who specializes in the conservation of textiles to perform the treatment. Even though the overarching goal of preservation is to prevent change, there are some objects that have issues that make intervention desirable. 
This is especially true when a sampler is not stable and likely to suffer further damage without conservation treatment. The Carolyn Jackson sampler has painted silk applied over a linen support with silk embroidery. The linen support is discolored and somewhat fragile, but the painted silk was shattering, which had already resulted in some losses and would likely to continue to deteriorate without conservation treatment. In this detail, you can see some of the losses of the painted silk right in front of the figure and also additional cracks in the neck area. The embroidery of this piece, which can be seen in the dress and the bonnet, was in good condition and didn't particularly need any treatment. The object was first removed from its original wooden stretcher and then gently cleaned using cosmetic sponges and carefully humidified and relaxed. Silk habitat was dyed with gouache for use as fills in the loss areas, and a silk gauze was tinted to match the areas of the sampler for use as an overlay on top of the damaged areas to stabilize the shattering silk. You can see the sample colors used to match the colors of the loss at the bottom on the left with the tinted silk gauze above that was laid over a drawing of the design of the sampler to get the right colors in the matching areas. The adhesive used to adhere the silk was Clucel G, a non-ionic adhesive that dries clear and remains flexible. It was applied to the new silk and reactivated using industrial denatured alcohol to secure it in place. The conservator on the right is using gloves and a respirator to protect herself during this step in the treatment. She is using light weights to hold the layers in place until the alcohol is evaporated, setting the adhesive. In the detail of the attachment to the stretcher before treatment on the left, you can see the deterioration of the linen support at the edges. Before the piece was reattached to the original wood stretcher, an acid-free mat board was applied to the front of the stretcher, and the mat board and wood were wrapped in new unbleached cotton to provide additional support for the object seen on the right. <clears throat> on the left in this slide is the object after treatment, and on the right is a detail of the figure. The tinting of the silk gauze overlay allows it to blend into the piece so that it is not distracting, even as it protects the original silk from further damage. Now, this is one of the pieces in our collection with an original frame, which includes the reverse painted glass that acts as a mat for the sampler. Given the fragile nature of this piece, both the sampler and the original glass of the frame NEHGS made the decision, a curatorial decision, to house this framed. During the reframing process, we included a new black mat behind the painted glass. This not only keeps the textile from coming in contact with the glazing, but the black mat also fills in small losses in the black paint without having to apply any paint or fills directly to the original glass. Given the damage to this piece, we have it stored in the dark and will strictly limit its exhibition in the future, although researchers will still be able to access this object for study with prior approval by special collection staff. Now, I often begin a preservation discussion with the ideal storage conditions for objects, but this information is so important that I wanted to end with it as the last part of the preservation uh, presentation. Preservation specialists often talk about temperature and humidity together, as these two environmental conditions are often linked. Relative humidity refers to the percentage of water vapor in a specific amount of air compared to how much total water could be held in the air at that temperature. So if you change the temperature of the air, you are often changing the relative humidity. 
seasonal changes in temperature and especially humidity can affect materials through expansion and contraction. Textiles in particular are hydroscopic, meaning that they readily absorb and release moisture, which changes their size on a microscopic level, damaging them as they cycle back and forth. So it's very important to maintain a stable temperature and a relative humidity that is in the range of 30 to 50 percent. We often suggest a temperature of 70 as that is more comfortable for humans. Objects would much prefer a colder temperature, but that is just not practical in most situations, especially in a home setting. Light causes permanent damage to textiles. It can't be undone. So it would be best to store samplers in the dark as much as possible. If you wanna have them on display, you can use a UV filtering glazing, but this only protects the objects from the most damaging parts of the light spectrum. Frame samplers should be placed in areas of lower light levels, if at all possible. They can always be brought out to areas of higher light levels for a short time frame to view them better. Since the environment that these objects are stored in is so important, they should never be placed in attics, basements, or garages. If they are stored in your living areas, you are much more likely to notice if there are any changes in the environment. Now I wanted to leave you with some actionable steps if you have samplers in your own personal collections. The first thing that you can do is to check the environment where you store these objects. You may already be doing this for your own comfort and can easily check to see if you are getting seasonal changes and if there's an easy way to minimize those changes. This will not only impact the textiles that you collect, but also any other materials. So it's a very worthwhile thing to do. Next, look around to find out how much light your samplers or other objects are being subjected to. If those light levels are high, is there another place that you can put the objects with lower light while still having the opportunity to enjoy them? If these are frame samplers, this will give you an opportunity to look at the framing package to see if there are preservation issues that could be addressed. Making a list that you can prioritize if you do need to make changes can help you with planning and getting a project started. If you have samplers that are not framed, what are they stored in? Folders and commercially available storage boxes are relatively inexpensive compared to the protection that they give. And also keep in mind that you don't have to do this all at once. Many of the pieces that we looked at today are 150 to 200 years old, and they likely did not have the best storage conditions for the majority of their existence. You have some time to make changes, so don't feel overwhelmed by thinking that you have to do everything at once. And the last thing that I'd like to mention is that, is that there are professionals to help you if you have questions about the preservation or conservation of items in your collection. Don't be afraid to reach out to someone. Thank you. All right, well, thank you both Judy and Todd for your fantastic presentation and all those examples that you showed um, and some really actionable uh, next steps if we do have samplers or other textiles in our own family archives. Um, so let's get to your questions. Go ahead and type anything that you'd like into the questions panel. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can in the next 10 to 15 minutes. Um, a few people are asking about, uh, and Todd, something that you just mentioned is finding a professional conservator. Um, how do you, are there sources out there? How would you find a qualified conservator to help you with uh, textiles or perhaps other items? Well, there's a national um, organization for conservators, uh, the American Institute for Conservation, uh, which has a website and I believe we'll be um, sending the participants a, a link to their find a conservator page and that is a, um, a searchable uh, page that you can put in your um, zip code and it finds 
uh, a conservator with the specialty that you're looking for um, based upon your geographic area. So they're trying to find conservators that are close enough to you to help. Another way that you can find a conservator, um, and I sometimes like this better even, is to contact a local institution with collections. Um, they're most likely either performing some kind of outside contract conservation work, or they may have a conservator on staff. And that way you can not only find a conservator, but also get some kind of recommendation about that conservator and what their work is like. So you might have to do a little bit of homework to find a conservator, um, but uh, you, you do have options and ways that you can uh, get in touch with, with several, in fact, not just one. And uh, for folks who may be listening to this in the future who don't get that email with uh, some of those links that I'll be sending out um, to participants, uh, the, um, the URL, if you just type in uh, culturalheritage.org, um, that's the website where you can put in your zip code and find a professional conservator in your area and also based on what specialty that you're looking for. So that's culturalheritage.org. Um, Judy, a question for you. Uh, Jackson asks, or kind of going back to some of the samplers and examples that you showed us, um, in some of the captions you had MSS and then a series of numbers or letters. What does that number refer to? Um, MSS refers to, of course, it being manuscript material. And the number is just a chronological number that we assign to pieces as um, we catalog them. So we just have a list of numbers from one to, you know, 10,000, depending upon where we are. And that's what the number is assigned to. It also tells us where it's, it also gives us a hint as to where it's located within special collections so we can easily find the piece. Right, so if you were to go to our library catalog, um, you would be able to type in that call number basically and learn more about some of the items yes, that we've exactly. uh, that we've shown. Um, now a few people are asking about unbleached thread and I think Todd you had mentioned that as a way to kind of um, you know nicely adhere uh, perhaps a sampler to a, a cloth support. Can you tell us where do you find unbleached thread? Is there a commercial name for it? Um, how do you locate that? Well, the um, the type that I'm most often working with is an unbleached Irish linen. So the linen is going to be stronger. Um, I don't know that it's all produced in Ireland at this point, but uh, there certainly was quite an industry for producing that um, historically. And so um, if you search for unbleached Irish linen thread, um, you should come up with a lot of different um, options for that. All right, great. Um, now we have a question about, um, you know, a large, maybe a larger textile, um, especially a sampler. Uh, would you recommend finding and maybe investing in a larger folder or box for that item so it can lay flat? Or is it possible to fold it? Um, and so, Todd, this is a, a question for you. Well, it's certainly possible to fold textiles um, because sometimes they can be very large. If you think about a quilt or something like that, um, you know, most people are not going to be able to have a box that can store a quilt flat uh, without being folded. So one of the things to keep in mind is every time you pull out a folded textile piece, when you refold it, try to fold it in a different place so that you're not always folding the same fibers. And you might also wanna use another piece of textile or um, even some acid-free um, unbuffered paper to pad the folds so that you're not getting sharp folds, but rounded folds. And they also make um, acid-free uh, large tubes uh, that you can use to roll things around if you really don't want to fold something. If for some reason it's very, um, it's very fragile and, and, it's, and it's very large and you think that folding it's going to do some damage, you can use um, an unbleached um, textile to, um, to wrap it around a roll. You want to roll with a fairly large diameter and they sell them you know, even in two or three foot diameters. 
and then maybe put a mylar or something like that around the outside to protect it from from dust. Um, so there are different strategies that you can you can use with a larger object. Great. Um, Judy, a question for you. Uh, so Lynn asks, if you find a difference in a birth or death date on a sampler from a town record, so the town record has a different date than what's on a sampler, which are you more likely to believe? Well, that's a good question. Um, I would say um, if you have an idea of when the sampler was created, it will, if it was created closer to the time when the young girl was um, had these living family members and so she may have had the opportunity to ask them, I would as a genealogist suggest that you try to verify the date in other records if possible, looking perhaps for a headstone record to see if the date is recorded there, um, to see if it might be in a death record. So there's a couple of things you can do looking at the piece itself and knowing something about the family, but also a little bit further research to see if you can verify it in other sources. All right, great advice. Uh, now several questions about whether or not to leave a sampler framed or to unframe it. Um, and also, uh, you know, if you're maybe framing it, what type of glass should you be using? Uh, so Todd, if you could talk a little bit more about framing textiles. Sure, so the, you know, the probably the biggest trigger for unframing something is, is there obvious damage that you're seeing or preservation issues with the frame? Does it look like it has an acidic backing that might be in direct contact with the object? Um, is the object in contact with the, the glazing? Is there some problem with your textile piece, with your sampler that seems like it's getting worse? All of those would be triggers that you, you may wanna um, have it taken out of the frame and have a conservator um, look at it. In terms of framing an object, um, besides some of the things that, that we talked about, you know, having a good quality material behind it, making sure that you have some kind of barrier between the, you know, the wood, if it's a wood frame and the piece. Um, there are several different options that you have for the glazing. So uh, there are UV plexiglass um, glazings that you can use and they will screen the UV. You wanna be a little careful with that if you have a textile that has um, threads or embroidery uh, or a support that seems like it has some issues because the, the plexi can actually um, create a static charge which will then attract that and it can lead to uh, you know damage in, in things that are you know already somewhat friable. Um, in terms of glass um, there are a couple of different types of uh, UV filtering glass, one would be an, a museum quality glass, which is probably the best option for that. And of course, that means it's the most expensive option, but then there are UV filtering glasses that have a coating on the glass that um, you just wanna make sure that you, you get the coating in the right direction or your, your framer gets the coating in the right direction, but that also will um, do that. So you could go with glass or plexiglass, you just need to make sure that it has a UV component to it. Um, and, and Todd, uh, some questions regarding photography. First of all, can you use photography to maybe um, help enhance some of those faded <laughs> uh, threads that are really difficult to see? Is there some kind of photographic process that could help you just kind of visualize what the original either may have looked at, looked like, or at least what the thread is trying to say. Um, and also is photography maybe a better way, if you do want to display something, should you take a photo of it and display that? I would say as a, as a conservator, 100%, if you can take a high quality uh, digital image of something and then get a, you know, they, they, they do such a great job now with um, prints, um, either on textured, um, printing paper, uh, that you can display uh, a reproduction and it looks really good and you can still have the original. If someone really you know, needs to see the original, you can bring it out. So I, I think that's a great way to go. Um, 
I would also encourage people, even if they're not going to do that for, you know, creating reproduction to display it, to definitely photograph things, to document them. And you can enhance that in, in two different ways if you're, if you're trying to get a, a better look at some of the faded um, parts of the sampler. So you can photograph it under different lights. Um, one type of lighting that often will help with faded um, thread would be um, photographing it under UV light, which um, we wouldn't normally say to subject something to UV, but it's such a short duration of UV that it, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. But it can actually fluoresce some of the pigments that are in the thread that even though you can't see them with your eye, they'll fluoresce under the UV and, um, and appear much stronger than they, than they do under the, you know, the naked eye. And you can also, in post-processing, um, enhance things. So you can use some type of um, you know, a photo um, program to try to um, work on the contrast, work on the colors. Um, they do that a lot with uh, photography for old photographs when they're you know, trying to manipulate the colors and, and make it look more the way it does. They can do the same thing with a sampler. Great, thank you. Um, so one final question, and um, I'll ask Judy about this. Uh, can you talk about, um, I mean, of course you showed several examples of samplers in our collection. Um, if someone is interested in finding a home for their samplers, um, so donating that item to our collection, how might they go about doing that? And would we be the likely repository uh, for that item? Oh, that's a good question. Um, they can reach me, they can reach out to me, uh, and I will um, discuss the object with them. Um, if it meets some of our criteria, and this is what I tend to look for in family samplers, I look for the name, a year, or a place, and we tend to be drawn to those types of samplers that have family registers, family records recorded on them because why because people come here to look for you know family records to fill out on the family tree if it's more decorative in style and recently i had one that i turned down that didn't have any of that information i try to make other recommendations um, so but first thing is contact me and we'll discuss the piece and i'll ask you lots of questions all right, well, thank you. And if you are interested in donating or learning more about our criteria for accepting donations, you can certainly write to Judy at library at nehgs.org and that will get uh, get to her and um, you can start your communication that way. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. If you have more specific questions about your family history research, you may consider hiring our research services team. You can learn more about those services by contacting um, uh, research at nehgs.org. And then I also want to let you know about a, um, a recent expansion of a free online chat service. Uh, so you can ch live chat with our genealogists Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Actually, that's Monday through Saturday. Sorry, recent expansion, Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, and the service is free. It's open to everyone. You do not need to be a member of American Ancestors. So if you do have a reference question or, um, you know, maybe you have a quick question about where to turn in your research, you can certainly avail yourself of that service on our website at AmericanAncestors.org slash chat. Um, now, I also want to say that I know many of you listening probably have um, samplers in your own collection, and we are interested in hearing those stories and maybe seeing some pictures of the items in your own collection. So if you'd like to, um, and then once we get kind of gather some of these stories, we can share them on our social media platforms with your permission. And if you're interested in sharing your story and your item, um, you can just send us a picture and a description of your ancestor's handiwork to stories at uh, AmericanAncestors.org. 
All right, so thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American ancestors to keep these programs free and to create more free programs for you and others. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org slash education. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.